Hi, this is your host Sapin Bhartia and welcome to another episode of TFR. Let's talk and today we have with us once again, Kit Merker, CEO at Noble9. Kit, it's great to have you back on the show. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me. First of all, you know, uh, tell us a bit about uh, SLO Conf. If I'm not wrong, this was the second one. Is that correct? And you folks, I think there are like, what, 3,000 or more registrations there. So so talk about the event. Yeah, sure. We, yeah, SLO Conf, we had um, our second event this year. And it was uh, it was a, like a 40% increase over last year. I don't know the exact number of attendees. But um, the really cool part about SLO Conf is we bring together so many industry experts. We actually produced... Uh, nine hours of content from the community that we uh, publish as part of SlowConf, all through our, uh, you know, open uh, call for proposals. And uh, the, the really the event is unique also in the structure because uh, there's no schedule. There's no keynotes. There's no times to show up. You can really kind of take it at your own pace. And so um, it was a global event. We had people from every every continent except Antarctica, I believe. Uh, joining in and and talking in our Slack space in a kind of an asynchronous way, you can attend while you work, et cetera. So that was a really uh, a fun event. And of course, all the content from both years is available on YouTube. So uh, if you check out slowconf.com, you can find all the content and, um, uh, you know, learn about uh, SLOs and it's content for everyone from beginners to, you know, experts, deep math stuff and uh, different controversial opinions and um, and everything like that. What were some of the trends that you saw? What I did see was the evolution of SLO, and folks are saying that it's kind of becoming a primary kind of observability in- instrument as well. So, t- so talk about uh, the trends that you've seen where folks are looking at SLOs differently than they used to look at it uh, earlier. Yeah, well, I've been doing this SLO stuff now as part of Noble Nine since 2019, and of course, it's a popular methodology for SREs at uh, site reliability engineers, you know, Google and production engineers at Facebook. And, um, but outside of that world, it's, it's less known. And I think one of the big things that's changed for me personally is, uh, people I talked to used to say, well, what is an SLO? I don't understand it to now saying, how do I get, how do I get this going? Right. How do I get this, uh, up and running? And so now, uh, the questions have been more about implementation. So a couple of things that we've done in the community around SLOs, uh, you know, one, uh, we had created a project called open SLO, which we launched, uh, last year. And that's really a uh, declarative format for describing SLOs in code. And SLOs as code is a really cool part of this whole observability stack where you can check in the definitions. There's no arguing about the definitions. So we, we launched that with Dynatrace and GitLab uh, last year. And then this year, you know, we had a lot of uh, contributions from Red Hat and Sumo Logic, and it actually went 1.0. So it's a stable uh, version of OpenSLO. And then we also created an open source project called Slow DLC, the, uh, the SLO development lifecycle. And that is... Uh, a uh, open sourced framework or methodology, a set of templates and tools to drive the project management around discovery and design and implementation of SLOs. And, uh, and th- that's also implementation ag- agnostic. We created that project with uh, partners like uh, Contino and Accenture and the customers like uh, OutSystems and others from the community Ford. And um, uh, we had such a great uh, kind of participation from different companies that are taking a different approach on that. And so this sort of trend of adoption that we've seen where companies are um, are seeing the future, right, which is about defining clear goals that is uh, described in code for how their services should work. And organizations are shifting to being sort of in this service-centric mindset uh, where they're now not thinking of it as, oh, I have IT and I have business. They now think of it as a digital stack that is a set of services and the people and the computers come together to really deliver that to customers. And SLOs are right, I think, at the, the center of that uh, movement. And people are seeing them as a, a, a very clear uh, tool for that. And now the next question is, like, how do I get into implementation, which I think is, uh, you know, for us is very exciting. We'll put it that way for Noble Mind. Are folks seeing uh, the business value of SLOs or how do they really, you know, relate it or, you know, directly connect it with the, you know, you know success, business success teams as well? Yeah. Well, I think... The, the, when people first learn about the SLO connection to business, I think what they imagine is a set of reports. They imagine you know, the dollars for the cost of downtime and say, oh, well, the service wasn't working perfectly. Therefore, you know, does it tell me how many dollars uh, we lost right, and how many customers. And that, that's actually not, not really the, the business connection with SLOs. It's really more about the decision making of uh, how you allocate resources. And uh, in this to, you know, the times we're in right now, you know, we really do need to focus our resources on the most important things this is always true in business and probably more so uh, right now. Um, but the kinds of things that you can look at is, you know, how does the 
unreliability of my services or the performance issues of my services actually affect the outcomes from the business. And those could be things like you know, how fast is our feature delivery? If you think of it from an, kind of an engineering perspective. It could be how, um, you know, how painful is our work-life balance for our engineers who are getting, you know, paged and woken up and managing the operations. It could be a question of, uh, you know, downtime impacting customer reputation and, and revenue. And all of those things are not, you know, it's not like a, uh, you know, tie it together directly and see a business report. It's not like a, you know, you don't see it on the balance sheet, but when you run business, you're thinking about KPIs, you're thinking about goals, you're thinking about how people are spending their time and, and energy toward um, the business outcomes that happen to be whatever your priority is at the time. And SLOs really do tie that together because they're encoding a set of customer expectations, trade-offs, and risks into the application that don't exist in any other way. And, and by doing that, you know, setting these very clear goals and saying, okay, look, you know, people come into your website, you know, 99% of the time it needs to work within X amount of seconds for the website to load. Or if I have a support queue of, you know, tasks that uh, an IT team needs to complete, we got to complete, you know, 99% of, uh, of those tickets need to get closed within three days. You know, those are both SLOs that could be described in code. And then you can lead to um, automated action, uh, which is the other, I think the other key thing in business is that we don't want to sit there watching, right? Oh, we got to keep an eye on everything. We want the system, you know, to alert us, to tell us, hey, you might have a risk that needs your attention. And so, that that shift when people really get into that mindset, right? About um, we want, we don't want to violate the expectations of our customers, right? You know, you think you know it's like you think about a restaurant and like how many times does somebody check on your table, right? How how long does it take before you walk in before you get seated? How long is the line at the host stand before you get a table assigned to you? All those things are uh, parts of that customer experience. That's all moved online, and so describing that to a you know to an employee, you can explain it to them. You go to a restaurant and this is what it should be like for our customers. It's a customer experience. We do it in software. Unfortunately, there's no one to explain it to yet. You have to describe it in code, and that's really what SLOs uh, and SLOs' code is letting you do. Since you were talking about, uh, you touched upon some of the cultural internal company aspect, also you know, getting paid and all the things. One more thing that is happening is today is we cannot ignore it. This is economy because of the COVID and the war. There, there are looming, you know, kind of tensions of res potential res uh, recession. But yeah. in, before that, also uh, we are going through this phase. First of all, there is a shortage of talent as already. Plus, because of you know the folks who are working from home, they don't want to change the way they have been working uh, when people are trying to bring them back. Uh, so a lot of, you know, uh, mass, you know, resignation or, you know, uh, th those kind of things are happening. So a lot of movement is already happening. And this, the, 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 uh, this this uh, recession is also creating a lot of challenges. Do you think that SLOs can also kind of help companies in kind of mitigate or address some of these uh, challenges as well? Yeah, I, I think the short answer is yes. Uh, the the way that um, and I was kind of alluding to this before, you know, the the thing that's really I think at, at a macro level, what what people are doing in their organizations right now is they have to focus their energy, they have to focus their resources, and they they can't drop the ball on customer experience or or say okay. You know, just because our stock got hammered, you know, we're going to stop burning the servers at the same efficiency or that, you know, the, the, the expectation doesn't necessarily uh, change. And, you know, to your point, right, from a uh, resignation perspective, tech talent is always going to be shorthanded and people are going to look for, um, you know, engineers are going to look for what they consider to be, you know, good places to work and safe places to work uh, and stable places to work. And so I think what SLOs bring to the table in this environment, you know, one is, uh, uh, helping you define what the goal is so people are, are on the same page. They can work on the same thing. You can define, you know, it's more important to have, you know, service A, maybe the one that does, you know, the payments processing, or is the, you know, the first look a customer has or other things that are critical to the business. This is, you know, the shape of that. And here's the risks of it. And, you know, these other services over here are either less important or we have more, you know, room for error and we can put less energy on that. Uh, that that is an important thing. It lets you run with less servers, it lets you run with less people, it lets you focus your energy on the things that truly matter. So I think that's a really critical piece and, and being able to run the same level of perception, right, of your services. And for enterprises, their services are vast. Everything from, you know, <laughs> supply chain to web to mobile uh, databases and all the different microservices and everything, it's these vast services. They don't just, you know, turn off overnight. So that's a, a key thing. And then uh, the other part of it is, you know, maintaining that uh, work-life balance, the remote work, et cetera. SLOs play a role in that too, because engineers understand that they don't want to be paged over nonsense. They want to be paged and they don't mind carrying the pager for legitimate issues. But what, what they won't stand is 
seeing an operation that's not uh, well organized and um, that you know sends alerts that are actionable. I like to say that uh, observability without action is just storage. And this is the you know the, really the key thing is we're thinking about cutting our storage bill, thinking about cutting our cloud bill, and thinking about keeping our engineers you know focused. Uh, that's really what we're what we're talking about here. And SLOs play a very I think very important role in that. Uh, one last question before we wrap this up is also that uh, we are talking about the adoption of SLOs growing for our seeing value, uh, but can you also talk about when they do uh, embrace it? What are some of the challenges that you see are common that or some mistakes that they make? And then you know, how would you suggest them to approach it in the right way so that they get the value that they should get out of it? Yeah, the, the, the thing I see more than more than anything else is people are hesitant to get started with SLOs because they think their, their, their infrastructure is not good enough or they haven't adopted the most modern technology. And so therefore, you know, they don't get started. They say, oh, we're still running on VMs. And I go, well, that's great. Most of the world is running on VMs. Like you, that, that's not, you know, you think, you know, there's, don't believe the hype that everyone's on containers and, and uh, serverless. Right. Uh, and, you know, the other, the, 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 the impact that this has and it's use a kind of a colloquial expression. It's like you're too busy chasing pigs to build a fence, you know. And this is what it feels like when you have a lot of outages and a lot of alerts, and you're trying to run your operations in a, a more manual way uh, without clear goals defined. And you know, I talk to companies and organizations about taking a step back and saying, okay, let's get started. You don't need to make perfect SLOs. You don't need to, uh, you know, re-architect everything. You need to get started with something and baseline it. And the SLOs come first in that digital journey. It's not. Uh, you know, we need to go and re-architect everything and then we'll be able to start setting clear operational goals. And I think that that causality is backwards sometimes, if you know what I'm saying. It's like, if we want to get to high reliability and then we'll have goals for, for our service, as opposed to saying, no, set the goals first and incrementally improve them over time and focus on short-term impacts. I, I would say that's number one. And this is what led to slow DLC. And if you check out slowdlc.com, you know, we have a set of materials there and in, in, there's a business case template. There's a slow, slow discovery template. I use this probably, multi, I would say multiple times a week, I'm, I'm going and downloading the template for a customer or a prospect or a, or a partner or a community member, and I'm just walking them through. Okay, who cares about your service? What happens when it doesn't work? Who, what are the dependencies? You know, what are the expectations on this service? Maybe they aren't even written down that customers have. And you go through this, this sort of process with them, step by step, asking the questions. And you go, okay, well, you actually do have all the answers to these things. You just haven't really thought about this in this sort of structured way. And getting this input from companies like Ford and Etsy and Oracle that are contributing to, to slow DLC, it's kind of battle tested already too. This is something that we've really used uh, and, and I've been able to use now, you know, with many companies as we're developing it. Uh, and now as it's been published, you know, people are starting to adopt it and they're, they're really excited by it. So I think this is to me, um, you know, the biggest blocker right now is just getting started. It's sort of like, Hey, I really want to get in shape and lose weight. I mean, I'm speaking to myself here, you know, <laughs> and so I, you know, you get the gym membership, you get the equipment and it's like, well, what, you know, what should I do? Well, you should get started. You know, right? you need to actually go do it. And, and that I think is the, the biggest challenge. I understand organizations have a lot going on, but it, it, to me, there's a, um, it's sort of a counterintuitive thing. I actually am hopeful that as people become more focused on efficiency and um, sustainability and, and cost savings, that this will become an accelerator for for slow adoption. We're already hearing that and seeing that as people are uh, saying, "Okay, look, you know, my observability stack is out of control. My cloud spend is crazy. My team is, you know, is ragged dealing with pages. We need to do something. We can't just keep, you know, hoping that the the environment will get better." And the SLOs become a key part of the strategy, along with other things too. By the way, right, improving their uh, their logging and architecture, improving their uh, their um, their software development practices, adopting you know sort of agile and testing and things like that, you know, it's part of that whole mix of how these organizations become uh, a lot better. And you know, um, we're even seeing things like you know hotel chains that are saying, "Oh, we have to have an app for check-in because they're uh, you know because of COVID." Well, in reality, it's actually a better experience to have the app for check-in and to use it as your you know hotel room key. That's actually a better experience anyway. So. To me, this is, uh, you know, you can kind of see, solve two problems at once because you're saying we have to become efficient, we have to become lean. That actually leads to, to innovation. And that's, I think that's the, to me, the most exciting part of uh, um, what people are now overcoming. They're realizing this and we're seeing that with the SLO adoption. 
Kit, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about not only the SFO con, SLO con but also uh, the whole evolution, how you folks actually helping uh, folks, you know, embrace. But I do see there are a lot of, you know, challenges. One is uh, certainly uh, around awareness and education and tell them that, yes, you, you are ready to embrace it. So uh, I would love to have you back on the show to discuss some of those topics as well. But uh, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. I'll, I'll be back anytime you want, man. Good to see you. Good chatting with you.